I'm going to rush through my message today simply because we want to give a lot of room for the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants and it throws off our timing. <laughs> yeah. And I'd rather conform to his timing anyway. So I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you today about the power of forgiveness. As people of the kingdom, we really have to be in a place where God can truly inhabit us. Because unless you are, the more you surrender to the the fullness of the Holy Spirit within you, the more capable you can be used by the Holy Spirit. And once you're into God's kingdom through the salvation of Messiah, one of the biggest stumbling blocks I have seen is people who have a hard time forgiving. The whole concept of entering the kingdom is the forgiveness of God towards us. And sometimes we lose focus that that's the first step is God forgiving us and reconciling us to him. And then we pass that on by forgiving and being reconciled to everybody else. In his outline for prayer, which Christianity calls the Lord's Prayer, which it is not, It's an outline on how to pray. He says in Matthew 6, verse 12, that one of the ways we address God is, um, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. In other words, I had issues, and God, I want you to forgive me the way I forgive anybody because I have offended you, and I just can't live to your standard. I want you to forgive me the way I have forgiven others as they are indebted to me. And lead us not into temptation. In other words, deliver us from the evil one. I don't want to have to totally be corrected by you all the time. I don't, want to, I don't want to totally have to always be going through correction because you're our Father, and of course you will correct us. But I want to have a pure relationship with you. In verse 14, keep going. One more, Joni. Four, Messiah says, if you forgive others their transgression, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's not a statement. That's a picture. As you forgive others, you work out the forgiveness God gives you. Because if I can't forgive others, I will never understand how God has forgiven me. And if I hold back forgiveness, I am opening myself up in my opinion, to a spirit of infirmity. I've seen this worked out in many people's lives that because I fail to forgive, I really don't receive the full forgiveness of God because if I understood that, I'd be able to forgive everybody else. And if I hold that back out, back from forgiving others when they have wronged me, I, I hurt myself. I hurt myself. And you, will, and you will, in my opinion, you're opening a door to a spirit of infirmity. Now, not all infirmities come from the spirit of infirmity, but there is a spirit of infirmity. And if you read the Bible carefully, particularly with Messiah's first coming, very often he went out, cast out demons, and healed people. That's not only... It's, Two different things. Often in the casting out of demons, you heal somebody. In my opinion, this is only my opinion, a lot of times a spirit of infirmity attaches itself to us because I choose to be wounded because I refuse to forgive somebody who hurt me, and I want to hold on to the wound. I want to hold on to the hurt. And because I want to hold on to the hurt, I'm inviting the spirit of infirmity to come in and hurt me. It's a door. 
In Mark 11, 25, Yeshua is teaching and he says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your heavenly father may also forgive you your transgressions. You come in and you want to worship God and you're praying. But if you remember that somebody has something against you, not you have something against somebody else, but remember that somebody has something against you, forgive him. So that your heavenly father may also forgive you. Now, God forgiving us is not predicated on our forgiveness, but if we don't forgive, we can't begin to be free Amen. and understand the fullness of God's forgiveness of us because of our transgressions. And it only hurts us. And as an example, there are people in this world that dislike you. And often it's not necessarily your fault, although at one time in your life you may have been stupid. <laughs> but the reality is, as much as possible, be at peace with all people. See, I don't want anyone to go to hell on my account. I don't care how much they've wounded me. I don't care how much they have rejected me. I don't, how, no, I don't care how much they have crushed me and pushed me and hurt me. God has forgiven me. I have to forgive them. Because if I don't forgive them, I'll never receive the fullness of the surrender to God and his forgiveness of me for when I did stupid things. Mark 6, 14 is the same thing. It's being repeated over and over again. 14 says, if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15 just says what happens. If you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you your transgressions. And again, it's an allegory. It doesn't mean I have to forgive so that God will forgive. If I do not forgive, I do not understand forgiveness. And if I do not understand forgiveness, I will never understand how God forgave me. And I will never truly be free. I will hold on to the hurt. And in my opinion, I will open myself up to the spirit of infirmity. And then I suffer. And sometimes I get angry with God. Why am I suffering? And I don't accept that he has totally paid for my redemption through the Messiah to set me totally free. But I keep myself in bondage because of hurts that somebody else did to me. And they've done it to me. They've done it against me. But if I don't forgive them, I will never totally receive the forgiveness of God. I bottle up his, the fullness of his redemption because I refuse to be redeemed. I want to hold on to the hurt. I want to hold on to the anger. And it grows and grows and opens all kinds of doors to us. Luke 17, verse 3. And again, think allegorically. Jewish audience, always allegories. Keep yourselves alert. Be alert. Pay attention. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If your brother sins, point it out. It's okay. I'm always up here trying to educate people. Not correcting, but directing. Why? Because we don't want to see you keep make mistakes. If somebody does something wrong, point it out. And if he repents, forgive him. Say, oh, okay, forgive him. And the next picture is the next verse, verse 4, which says, let me go to my notes. Even if he sins against you seven times a day and seven times returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Not you should. Somebody keeps messing up. And you say, you're messing up. He says, I'm sorry. And he comes back. Oh, you're, you're messing up again. I'm sorry. And he comes back. Keeps doing the same thing over and over. And we get frustrated and say, forget it. That's not what God says because God doesn't forget. He corrects us so that we will return to him. But I can't really return to him and receive the fullness of his forgiveness if I refuse to forgive somebody else. Even if I have a legitimate gripe because I'm telling you, God had a legitimate gripe against me. 
because I was rebellious against him. John 20, 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. But if you hold back, they are held back. In other words, you hurt me. If I forgive you, you are forgiven. I said, I'm not going to forgive you. Now I'm putting them under judgment. I become the judge, even though I've been called, told not to judge. No, you hurt me, and I'm going to hold on to this hurt because you deserve to be punished. I'm holding on to the hurt, and I am the one who is more damaged because I have opened the door. And I said, in my opinion, this is my only my opinion, one of the biggest reasons people have a spirit of infirmity is because they have refused to forgive. I was on the board of director of Rose Price. Some of you know Rose. Some of you remember Rose. Rose was uh, uh, in five different slave labor camps, uh, Nazi slave labor camps, and she was used for experimentation. She was used for a lot of things, and she went in as a, a young girl, a young girl, preteen, and she was passed from camp to camp as they run ex ran experiments on her. She was badly damaged, as you might understand, and a lot of you knew her. And when she got out, she was not exactly in the best of shape. And I said, I was on a board of directors. I'm not speaking against Rose, just that reality. When you go in and start at 10 years old to be medically experimented on, you're spending experiment on for like five years by animals. When you come out, you don't say, okay, all smooth. She had 22 operations because she was critically in pain all the time. And they kept operating and operating and operating. Finally, the Holy Spirit got a hold of her. And she ended up, and if you know her, you know her whole ministry was about forgiveness. And she was, she toured Europe. And she ran into one of the guards from Auschwitz who she knew who came to her, and she forgave him. She ended up marrying one of my elders down at Beth Yeshua. Uh, she had a whole ministry. She, she was a part of my daughter's wedding when my daughter got married to uh, Rabbi Isaac. Rose was a part of her wedding. She was a family friend for, for a long, long, long time. One of my elders, again, in Fort Myers wrote, uh, wrote her life story, uh, which wasn't published. I have it, but nobody else does. But I'm telling you, if I, if I don't forgive somebody else, they're held back. And I'm telling you, if I want to hold somebody back, I end up, I'm damaging myself because I'm holding myself back because I've opened that door. I have opened that door. Ephesians 4.31, a Greek letter, so it's not allegorical. It's analytical. Get rid of all bitterness and rage, anger and quarreling and slander, along with all malice. It's a step-by-step. -step. Get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, all quarreling, all slander, all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassion compassionate, forgiving each other as God and Messiah has also forgiven you. You want to understand the forgiveness of God? Forgive others. And if you refuse to forgive others, you're not understanding the forgiveness of God. Colossians 3, verse 12, another Greek letter. Therefore, summation is God's chosen people. Why? Because God chose us. We didn't choose him. We don't come into the kingdom unless the Father first draws us. Holy and dear, dearly beloved, clothe yourself with tender compassion, kindness, humility, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord pardoned you, you must also pardon others. This is repeated over and over and over and over because to really grasp the significance of God forgiving me, I must forgive everybody else so I can be free. 
so I can be free. Matthew 18, you have the typical Galilean question from Peter. Verse 20, Peter came to him and said, Master, how often shall I forgive my brother? Up to seven times? I'm a good guy. This is Peter who, you know, was an apostle but walked around with his foot in his mouth. Should I forgive my brother seven times because I'm super spiritual? And Yeshua said, no. In verse 22, not seven times, I tell you, but 70 times seven. How often do I have to forgive somebody? Seven times? He may have heard that. He said, no, no, let's start with 70 times seven. One time, once, you, once you forgive somebody 70 times seven, you might actually start understanding what forgiveness is. And when I understand what forgiveness is, now I understand what happened to me when God forgave me. Matthew 18, 23. A parable, a picture of the kingdom. A parable is a story, an allegorical story, that explains what the kingdom of God is like. This is after the unpardonable sin. And so he's only going to teach in parables to that particular generation. To teach the deep things of the kingdom of God. And this is one of those teachings. Verse 23, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. This is the kingdom of heaven. This is what it's like. A king who wants to settle accounts with his slaves. Verse 24, we begin to settle up. A man brought, was brought to him, owed him 10,000 talents, but since he didn't have the money to repay, his master ordered him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment, to, payment be made. That was a tradition. Debtor's prison, right? Verse 26, then the slave fell on his knees and begged, say, be patient with me and I'll repay everything. And the master of the slaves, filled with compassion, released him and forgave the debt. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. A king wants to settle an account with his slaves. The kingdom of heaven is like the king wanting to settle an account with his slaves. And we owe so much we can't pay back. He says, it's okay. I love you. I'll forgive you. Verse 28. Now that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. And he grabbed him and started choking him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down, begging him, saying, be patient with me. I'll pay you back. Yet he was unwilling. Instead, he went off and threw the man into prison until he paid back what all he owed. In other words, the king had forgiven this slave, but this slave is not going to forgive somebody else. So he received forgiveness because of compassion. But he went out, and rather than passing that on, he held back and said, no, you offended me. I won't forgive you. Verse 31, so when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply distressed. They went to their master and reported what had happened. Verse 32, then summoning the first slave, his master said, him, you wicked slave, I forgave all that debt because you pleaded with me. Verse 33, wasn't it necessary for you also to show mercy on your fellow slave just as I showed mercy to you? If I forgave you, isn't it necessary that you forgive somebody else? Because if you don't understand what happened when I forgave you, you'll go out and you won't understand that, so you won't forgive somebody else. But if I forgave you, isn't it necessary that you forgive somebody else? In rage, his master handed him over to the torturers until he paid back all he owed. In the summation of this particular Parable, verse 35, so my heavenly Father will do to you unless each of you from your heart, from your heart, forgives your brothers. The king forgives you your debt. Isn't it necessary you forgive everybody else? And you know what? This is what, this is what your heavenly Father will do to you if you don't from your heart forgive your brother. And it's not that there wasn't a debt owed. It's not that there wasn't offense taken. It's not that they weren't angry and loved me and hurt me and abused me and misused me. In Matthew 5, which is before the unpardonable sin, in chapter 5, and it's talking about how do you overcome evil? What's the key to overcoming evil? 
In verse 38, you have heard it was said. He is quoting the Mishnah. He is not quoting the Bible. When he quotes the Bible, he says, it is written. When he's quoting the Mishnah, is, you have heard it has been said or you have been taught by your fathers. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39, but I tell you, do not resist the evildoer. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other. Verse 40, if, 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 if one wants to sue you and, and, and take your shirt, let him, let him take your coat. Nobody likes these particular pictures he's drawing here for us. Verse 41, somebody forced you to go to one mile, walk one mile with him, walk two miles with him. Verse 43, this is a teaching of, in the Galilee during the first stage of his Sanhedrin investigation. And these people are saying, wow, he doesn't talk like the religious people. Verse 42, give to the one who asks of you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Verse 43, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You can thank the Romans for that particular line. Verse 42, but I tell you, which is a Mishnaic term. The rabbi says this, I say this, I say that. He's not, this is not a scriptural debate, this is a Mishnaic Mishnah is the first half of the Talmud. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a kingdom thing. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive them. Someone's persecuting you. I was in a place where I tend to be at times. There's a guy that just hates me. He just hates me. And it's not particularly because of who I am. He doesn't know who I am. It's not... Anti-Semitic. Not everybody that hates me is an anti-Semite. Some people just hate me. <laughs> I know, you should understand that. There are people who just dislike you. They just hate you. They can't stand you. And you might not even know why. I don't know why, I know why but he's wrong. <laughs> I, I give you examples. A couple people here from the gym. There's a brown shirt in there. Guy was a brown shirt in the ghetto. In other words, he was a Nazi. And he helped, he took care of our Jew. We took care of our Jews. We put them in a ghetto. A lot of the Jewish members of the Jew are offended at me because I'm actually nice to him. And a lot of them are really offended because that's the way he talks. Ah, oh, we took care of our Jews. We put them in the ghetto. They were fine until the Nazis came and emptied it. He's a brown shirt. And it's like, and some of the Jews in the gym really were offended that I wouldn't hate him. Because most of the Jews who know who he was hated him. He's a brown shirt. It's like, well, I'm not going to hate him. I don't particularly appreciate that he took care of, our, he took care of his Jews. <laughs> My whole family was put in the, in, in the ghetto of Kelvno. It's like, I don't, I don't appreciate that, but you know what? I'm not supposed to judge him. God is judged. I, I don't have to forgive him. He didn't offend me. He didn't offend me. There's nothing to forgive. If he would ask me to forgive, I, I, I had some other people. I had a group of Lutheran pastors come to me and say, we want you to forgive us for Martin Luther and his tractate, what do we do with this damnable race of the Jews? And I said, it's nothing for me to forgive. I, you didn't write it. You're not responsible for what he wrote, and I'm not responsible to forgive you. I don't have to forgive you. There's no ties. You know, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. This is the kingdom thing. I've been forgiven. I'm not going to hold animosity, and I don't want anybody to be judged because they annihilated my family or my wife's family, or some of you, your families, sometimes died under that. In the past two years, there's more, been more Christians crucified than Romans crucified their whole reign. They're still crucifying them. What was the number? Went a little over 1,200, and uh, uh, well, if you don't know it, you don't know it. They're crucifying Christians all over, all over Africa. But they're not the right kind of Christians, so we don't worry about them. In the letter to Jacob, who was called James in honor of King James, chapter 2, verse 8. 
and it's just a allegorical statement throwing it out for you to grasp if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture you shall love your neighbor as yourself you do well see the problem with the body of messiah is full of people one of the problems we have at beth messiah is the people that come here <laughs> and it would be a perfect congregation if it wasn't for those people But Jacob, the brother of Yeshua, just throws this out. It's not up there. I'll look back here. If you fulfill the royal law, this is the law of God. This is the Torah. According to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. Romans 12, the confused congregation. The first congregation that ever existed that had Gentile leadership because Caesar threw all the Jews out of Rome, and they ended up, it was planted by people from the second chapter of Acts who were in Rome, who were in Jerusalem and went home to Rome, and it was planted by that group of, of Jewish leadership. But then, but then Caesar threw all the Jews out, and the congregations there, so the Gentiles took over. It's the first time that ever happened. And they got really confused, and Paul writes a letter to them saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You got to understand this. Did God forsake Israel? God forbid. I am Israel, Right? And he's actually spelled all this out in the previous three chapters. And in verse 12, he says, repay no one evil for evil. Which is not the Roman way, but repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to what is good in the eyes of all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live in shalom with all people. As, as long as, see, I can say that. I can honestly say that. As far as I'm concerned, I'm at peace with everybody in the world. Not everybody in the world is at peace with me. That's their problem. As much as it depends on me, I choose to be at peace. A lot of people have, have done their best to hurt me. I choose to release the hurt and forgive them because I have been forgiven. I'm not going to hold on to any hurt because I don't want the hurt. If I hold on to the hurt, I'm inviting the hurt. If I invite the hurt, I'm inviting a spirit of infirmity, my opinion. And I'm hurting because I, that's what I want. Verse 19, they don't have scriptures up there anymore. Never take your own revenge, loved ones. Give room for God's wrath. It is written, vengeance is mine. I, uh, say, uh, I, I, will, I will repay, says Adonai, what's to say, Adonai, uh, just says Adonai, it doesn't have a title to him. I, I, I don't have to judge somebody else. Let God judge them. I, I don't have to take revenge against somebody. I'll let God take care of them. I'm responsible for me. I'm going to forgive. I'm not going to be hurt because somebody tried to hurt me. Verse 20, rather love your enemy. If your enemy is, is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you'll heat coals of fire on his head. It's okay. Just bless people, bless people, bless people. I want him to be judged. Let God be the judge. Quit worrying about their judgment. Let God handle the judgment. You bless them and bless them and bless them. Luke 23, 33. When they came to the place of the skull... If you've ever been to the garden tomb in Jerusalem outside of Damascus Gate, before they kind of stopped allowing the guys to point out the skull that is above the Arab bus station that's there, and they're not allowed to point that out anymore. They crucified Yeshua with, and, and the evildoers, one on each, one on other, one on one side and one on your side. In other words, they had to can't, they crucified three that day. They were always crucifying Jews all over Jerusalem, all over Israel. They were crucifying people every day. They happened to crucify him at the same time. They were crucifying a couple others. Um, and Yeshua was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And they cast lots of verses. <laughs> they, he's talking about Romans who put a crown of thorns, pulled out his beard, beat him till he was almost dead, drug him up, crucified him naked. Not like the Catholic, let's put a loincloth. We wouldn't want to embarrass him while we're killing him. <laughs> crucified him naked where he suffocated because crucifixion causes you to suffocate. 
because of the way you hang. And as he's dying, he said, you need to forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is the Messiah, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's okay. I used to get revenge. I used to be pretty tough. I used to, it's like Mitch up here, he's a, he's a Craig McGunn instructor. He's really self-defense. He knows. He knows the rules of warfare. You never step back. You always push in. You always press in. I'm actually judo, so I actually can go either way. But you understand, it's, 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 I'm a new creation. I don't have to judge anybody else. I just need to let them go because God let me go. You all, you all know the story of Job. I'm going to end with this story. I don't know where my scriptures are going, Joni, but I'm going to end with this one. Job goes through this. Hopefully, you, you, you know. You want to say something before I... Job, Job goes through all kind of hell, and you don't know why, and quit trying to build a theology of why he went through that. And he has his three friends that come in and make it worse. Okay, yes, yeah, so I agree to that. And, and he's just going through a difficult time. And for, for like... 35 chapters, his friends would say, why don't you just give up and die? You deserve this. You're a louse. You deserve what's happening to you because of the kind of wretched person you are. And it's just a, it, it, the book of Job reveals to you what the enemy is like. It doesn't, re, it doesn't reveal to you what God is like. It reveals what the enemy is like. This is accepted as the oldest book in the Bible predates Abraham. In chapter 40, he's reached the end of the line, and the question is, will the one who contends with Shaddai correct him? Let him who accuses God answer. God's saying, look, you want to argue this out? We'll argue this out. And Job answered Adonai, he said, Indeed, I am unworthy. What can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer twice. I will say no more. He's been complaining to God. And God said, Yeah, you want to argue with me? Let's argue. And he said, Wait, I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once. I spoke twice. I'm done speaking. I'm done speaking because he's dealing with God. That's where you are in the story. If you don't know the story, read it. Chapter 42, Job answers Adonai. God says, you want to argue? Let's argue. Verse 2, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this who darkens counsel without knowledge? Sure, I spoke without understanding things I was, that were too wonderful for me, which I did not know. It's an exchange back and forth between God and Job. You said, hear now and I will speak. I will question you and you will inform me. I heard this is, this is Job. You said, hear now and I will speak. I will question you and you will inform me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Then after this exchange with God, which is verse 7, this is an allegorical, I mean, this is analytical, it's not a, Adonai said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, which was the first guy that came in and started telling him how bad he was, my anger was kindled against you because, and against your two friends. These are the three people that have been harassing Job. Because you have not spoken about me, what is right, like my servant Job has. Now he's finally stepping in and like, hey, you three guys that have been messing around for the last 35 chapters, I'm ticked. You weren't speaking for me. Only my servant Job was speaking for me. Okay? Am I still on that? 
Yes. My servant Job will pray for you. And I will accept Job's prayer and not deal with you according to your folly because you have not spoken correctly against me like my servant Job. So he says, I'm ticked off with you guys. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Job's going to pray for you. Verse 10. Or 9. Up there, it doesn't have the address. I keep, it, it's like, it's, oh, it's all kind of addresses up there. I just went. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, so far the Temanite, went and did what Adonai told them, and Adonai accepted Job's prayer. You miss these little things. They did what he said. They went to Job and let him pray for them. And God expect, accepted Job's prayer because Job I prayed for them and forgave them. Job was open to be restored to everything God had for him because he understood forgiveness. Verse 10, so Adam and I restored what Job had lost after he had prayed for his friends. And Adam and I doubled everything that Job had had before. So you have to understand, I'll just, I'm going to reiterate so none of you miss the importance we forgive out of our indebtedness and obedience to God in his decision we make. And as we do our part forgiving, we discover the command to forgive is actually for my good, not for their good. And we receive the reward of our forgiveness, which is spiritual freedom. I can truly be free because I'm not accepting the hurt and the pain. I'm not accepting rejection because when I accept these things, I'm saying I want the spirit of, of, of rejection. I want the spirit of infirmity. I want these spirits. We're not saying that, but that's what we're opening ourselves up to. And we will know the work of forgiveness complete when we experience the freedom that comes as a result. Because we are the ones who suffer the most when we choose not to forgive. And when we do forgive, the Lord will set our hearts free from anger and bitterness and resentment and hurt that previously imprisoned us. And you should not leave this place today imprisoned by what you open yourself up to from others who have wronged you. It's time to break that and be set totally free so God can do all that he wants to do in you. Don't worry about them. God is judge, not you. If you like to come up and receive prayer, that you could truly walk in this, I'm going to invite Agatha's team up to pray for you. Don't leave here bound up by any hurts you have from anybody else. Be blessed, everybody. Shabbat shalom.